Yes, thank you very much. So, yeah, I will start uh, from a brief introduction on the graph case before talking uh, about uh, sp general spectral theory of hypergraphs. Um, the motivation for studying uh, spectral graph theory comes from networks, because as we all know, graphs uh, can, of course, model many empirical networks. And the spectrum of any operator associated to a graph, such as, uh, for instance, the adjacency matrix or the Kirchhoff Laplacian or the normalized Laplacian, encodes uh, important qualitative properties of the graph. So this is why studying it uh, is a very common tool, both in uh, pure mathematics and in data analysis. And I will focus on the normalized Laplacian, or better said, on the normalized Laplacians. Um, we fix a graph on n vertices and m edges, which is uh, simple. So it is unweighted, undirected, uh, without loops, without multiple edges, and without uh, isolated vertices. It is undirected but it is oriented, meaning that we, we fix an arbitrary orientation on the graph on which our results, our computations will not depend. And in particular, for each edge, uh, we choose one of its endpoints uh, to be an input and the other endpoint to be an output. So this is what it means to give uh, an orientation. And then, um, based on the orientation that we fixed, we define the incidence matrix of the graph as the n times m matrix in which the um, rows correspond to the vertices, the columns correspond to the edges. And we have uh, entry uh, ij equal to one if uh, um, vertex vi is an input for edge ej, entry minus one if vi is an output for ej and zero otherwise. So each column will, will have exactly one one and exactly one minus one. Uh, we then define the degree of a vertex uh, as the number of edges containing that vertex and we let the degree matrix of our graph be the diagonal uh, um, matrix uh, uh, that has the degrees in the diagonal. And one way of uh, defining the normalized Laplacian is to see it uh, as the n times n matrix uh, defined as the inverse of the degree matrix, uh, which is uh, usually well defined because we assume that uh, every vertex has degree bigger than zero, times uh, the incidence matrix times the transport, transpose of the incidence matrix. And as uh, Leonard said uh, in the previous talk, although in another context, uh, it's always good to consider also the dual problem. And we also um, define the dual normalized Laplacian as the m times m matrix uh, defined as the transpose of the incidence matrix times the inverse of the degree matrix times uh, the incidence matrix. And we have that the Laplacian L as n real non-negative eigenvalues, which are always between uh, 0 and 2, where n again is the number of vertices of the graph, while the dual Laplacian has m real non-negative eigenvalues, so the number of edges, and the non-zero spectra of these two Laplacians coincide. This is very useful uh, both in theory and in applications, because sometimes uh, uh, it's better to concentrate on L when one wants to compute the eigenvalues or to get insights about the eigenvalues, and other times it is more convenient to consider the dual Laplacian. And we know that the multiplicity of zero for L equals the number of connected components of G, so in particular zero is always an eigenvalue for the graph case while the multiplicity of zero for the dual Laplacian equals the number of cycles of the graph. And the largest eigenvalue has a nice geometric interpretation because it is always uh, between uh, n over n minus one and two, and it is equal to n over n minus one if and only if the graph is complete, meaning that all vertices are connected with each other as uh, the one here on the left-hand side. 
and it is equal to two if and only if a connected component of G is bipartite, meaning that the vertex set can be decomposed into two sets such that there are no vertices, no, no edges uh, between vertices in the same set of the bipartition. So as here on the right hand side. So in general, we can say that for a connected graph, the largest eigenvalue tell us uh, how, uh, how much between being complete and bipartite our graph is. So we can give this geometric interpretation to lambda n. And the first non-zero eigenvalue has also a nice uh, geometric interpretation. In fact, if we consider a connected graph, then of course uh, um, this has uh, zero as an eigenvalue with multiplicity one, because as I said, uh, the multiplicity of zero for L counts the number of connected components. And therefore, lambda 2, the second eigenvalue of L, is also the first non-zero eigenvalue. And this eigenvalue is controlled both above and below by the discrete Shiger constant, which is defined in this way. We are taking the minimum over all non-trivial subsets S of the vertex set, and then we consider the number of edges between S and its complement over the minimum between the volume of S and the volume of its complement, where the volume of a set is the sum of the vertex degrees uh, of the vertices contained in that set. So what are we actually doing is we are looking for a partition of the vertex set into S and its complement S bar, so that S and S bar have approximately the same volume and there are as few edges as possible between S and S bar. So H measures how far our graph is from a disconnected one. And finding the set S and the set S bar, and in particular finding these edges between S and S bar that we should remove in order to, to get the, the best uh, cut, the trigger cut, uh, means solving the problem and uh, disconnect the graph as here in this picture. And these are the Chigar inequalities for the, for the first non-zero eigenvalue of a connected graph. And since we have these inequalities uh, that bound uh, lambda two both abo above and below, we can actually approximate uh, the Chigar constant using lambda two. So we can say that lambda two also has a geometric uh, interpretation. And by the proof of these inequalities, it also follows that we can actually use the eigenvectors of lambda two in order to approximate the Chigar cut. So in order to approximate uh, uh, the sets S and S bar that are optimal. In fact, we can always see an eigenvector as a function on the vertex set. And then uh, if, we, if we take an eigenfunction of lambda two and we look at the vertices on which it has uh, non-negative values and the vertices in which uh, it has negative values, then in this way, we get a partition of the vertex set that approximates the Chigar partition. So we can also approximate the Chigar cut using the um, eigenfunctions. And I will now switch to the case of hypergraphs. So first of all, what are hypergraphs and why do we use hypergraphs? Hypergraphs are a generalization of graphs in which we still have vertices. And now instead of just having pairwise connections between them, we can put together, we can join uh, vertices with edges of any size. So for instance, here I draw three times the same hypergraphs, uh, hypergraph uh, on six vertices and two edges. The blue edge joins three vertices and the orange edge joins four vertices. So a hypergraph is simply a set, uh, 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 it's simply given by sets of vertices. 
And um, if all edges have cardinality two, then of course we have a graph. And they are of course uh, very interesting from the mathematical point of view, but also from the practical point of view because they can model many empirical networks, for instance, social networks, scientific collaboration networks, neural networks, epidemic networks, chemical reaction networks. For instance, um, let's consider the case of uh, scientific collaboration networks. In this case, we can let the vertices be the researchers and the edges be the research papers. And we want to uh, link together the authors of a given paper. Of course, a graph is not enough for doing that. So we need to have sets of any cardinality because um, the authors of a given paper can uh, form a set of any cardinality. And then a similar intuition holds for chemical reaction networks, for instance. Uh, usually we model vertices as, uh, um, sorry, uh, chemical elements as vertices and then uh, it is natural to model the chemical reactions as uh, edges of any cardinality involving uh, uh, more than uh, two edges also. And there are also generalizations of these classical hypergraphs. For instance, uh, Nathan Reff and Lukas Rusnak introduced the oriented hypergraphs uh, on which uh, for simplicity I will focus today. And uh, here in this picture, for instance, we have an oriented hypergraph. An oriented hypergraph is a hypergraph, so we still have vertices and edges, but in addition, we also have uh, a sign for each vertex edge incidence, so a plus or a minus sign. And in the chemical hypergraphs that I introduced uh, with uh, my PhD supervisor, Jürgen Jost, uh, we also allow for vertices to have both an, a plus and a minus sign for an edge. Um, and the idea is that in this way, we also model catalysts in chemistry because these are elements that take part in the reaction but are not changed by it. And recently, I also introduced the hypergraphs with real coefficients also together with Jürgen. Uh, and in this, um, in this model, instead of just giving a sign, so uh, just instead of just giving a plus one or a minus one, we give uh, for each vertex edge incidence a coefficient, a real coefficient. And the idea is that, for instance, we can model in this way also the stoichiometric coefficients from chemistry or we can model hypergraphs uh, uh, in which each vertex has a given probability to belong to a given edge. And I also introduced together with Nathan Ref the complex unit hypergraphs for which the uh, coefficients are, uh, come from the complex unit circle. But as I said, I will, uh, I will concentrate on the oriented hypergraphs today. And Formally, we define an oriented hypergraph as a triple where V is a finite set of vertices, E is a multi-set of edges, and the edges are sets of vertices. And it's a multi-set meaning that uh, two different edges can contain the same, the same vertices, but we label E so that it looks like a, a set and we can treat it as a set. And we also have an incidence function, um, which is uh, uh, which gives um, a sign, so either a plus one or a minus one to each uh, pair vertex edge, and it is non-zero if and only if uh, uh, the vertex v belongs to the to the given edge. And we say that v is an input uh, for the edge e if the incidence uh, uh, corresponding to B and E is equal to plus one, while it is an output if the incidence is equal to minus one. And for these, um, for these hypergraphs, uh, I introduced together with Jürgen also the, the generalized normalized Laplacians. And in this case, we again, define the incidence matrix 
of our hypergraph as the enzyme SAM matrix, which has entries one, minus one, or zero. Um, and the definition looks exactly like the definition from the graph case, but the difference is that in the graph case for each column, so for each edge, we had exactly one input and exactly one output. In this case, we can have uh, uh, as many inputs as we want as, uh, and as many outputs as we want. So even though this definition looks the same, the incidence matrix actually looks uh, different. And also, uh, we define again the degree matrix as the diagonal degree matrix that has the degrees in the diagonal. And again, we define, uh, uh, in this case, the uh, degrees uh, the degree of a vertex as the number of edges that contain that vertex, but there are also other ways that uh, in which one can uh, uh, generalize the notion of vertex degree. And again, we define the normalized Laplacian and the dual Laplacian uh, in this way. So the definitions look like before, but um, in practice, uh, these matrices are more complicated in the hypergraph case and also the results uh, about the spectra change. Um, so here we already have a, a, a result that changes for hypergraphs. Uh, in the case of hypergraphs, the Laplacian has again n real non-negative eigenvalues, but now they are between zero and n, the number of vertices. While for the case of graphs, we always have that the spectrum is between zero and two, and we will see why this happens. And uh, again, the dual Laplacian has M real non-negative eigenvalues. And again, the non-zero uh, spectra of these two Laplacians coincide. And now we lose the property that the multiplicity of zero for L counts the number of connected components. In particular, we can have uh, hypergraphs that don't have zero as, uh, as an eigenvalue at all. Um, and we can also have connected hypergraphs uh, with a high multiplicity of zero. So it's, uh, the, this property is completely different in the general case. And we can say uh, that we can characterize more generally the multiplicity of zero in terms of maximum number of linearly independent edges, where um, in order to talk about dependence, uh, we see each edge as the sum of all its inputs minus the sum of its outputs. And we can generalize bipartite graphs by defining bipartite hypergraphs in this way. We say that G is bipartite if we can decompose the vertex sets into two sets, again, uh, disjoint V1 and V2, uh, such that each edge has all its inputs in V1 and all its outputs in V2 or vice versa. And we can also have that either V1 or V2 is empty. Um, so this generalizes um, the notion of bipartite graph to the case of hypergraphs. And as we saw in the case of graphs, uh, bipartiteness is related to the largest eigenvalue. And something similar, this can be generalized actually for hypergraphs. In fact, for the hypergraphs, we have uh, these two inequalities, um, where here uh, in the second one, uh, uh, we are maximizing over uh, bipartite sub hypergraphs. And the upper bound uh, is interesting because it tells us uh, that the largest eigenvalue is always less or equal than the maximum edge cardinality with equality if and only if the, the, the hypergraph is bipartite and uniform, where uniform means that all edges have the same size. So in the case of graphs, uh, this inequality is uh, uh, again telling us uh, that lambda n is less or equal than two with the quality if and only if the graph is bipartite because we know that of course graphs are two uniform uh, hypergraphs since all edges have cardinality two. And 
as, a, as I said, uh, when we consider, uh, when we want to show whether a hypergraph is bipartite, we can also let one of these two sets uh, be empty. Uh, so for instance, hypergraphs uh, for each, uh, each vertex is an input uh, uh, for all out, for all edges in which it is contained are a special case of um, bipartite hypergraphs. And one can show that if G is a bipartite hypergraph, then it is isospectral. So it has the same spectral as the bipartite hypergraphs, uh, a hypergraph with only inputs obtained from G by letting each uh, vertex being an input. Uh, in all edges in which it is contained. So the spectrum doesn't change. If we want to compute the spectrum of a bipartite hypergraph without loss of generality, we can reduce <clears throat> to this simpler case. And as a side note, while the eigenvalues don't change when going from G to G plus, the eigenvectors do change. And in the particular case of graphs, uh, if G is a simple graph, as, as I said, we always have that each edge has exactly one input as, and exactly one output. So G plus is not a, um, a simple graph, but it is a signed graph. And in this case, we have that lambda is an eigenvalue for G simple graph, if and only if two minus lambda is an eigenvalue for G plus. So the signed graph uh, with only plus signs. And in particular, all properties of the uh, of the spectra uh, of the spectrum of G are mirrored for the case of G plus. And as an example, uh, we can take uh, the hyperflower. Um, the hyperflower is a is a hypergraph that has uh, m leaves, so m edges. And then each edge contains uh, exactly T peripheral vertices and C central vertices. And the C central vertices are contained in all, uh, in all edges, as uh, in this picture here. And then if the hyperflower is bipartite, uh, by uh, what I just said, we can simply compute the spectrum by considering the case in which the hyperflower has only inputs. And uh, one can check that in this case, the spectrum is given by zero with multiplicity n minus m, t uh, with the multiplicity m minus one, and lambda n is equal to c plus t. So what, uh, what are we seeing here? Here we have the largest eigenvalue, which is equal to the, um, to the edge cardinalities, so since the edge cardinalities are all the same. Uh, so this follows from the theorem that I stated before. And uh, um, zero is an eigenvalue with a high multiplicity. This is due to the fact that we have many more vertices than edges. And also T uh, is an eigenvalue with a very high multiplicity. And in general, having uh, eigenvalues uh, with high multiplicity means uh, uh, that there are strong symmetries in the hypergraph that we are considering. So symmetries leave signatures in the spectrum. And in particular, uh, they create uh, eigenvalues with high multiplicities. As another example, um, a classical graph is, of course, the complete hypergraph, uh, sorry, the complete graph um, in which uh, all vertices are, contain, are, are joined with each other. And we can generalize it by um, defining a K complete hypergraph as a hypergraph uh, um, that contains all edges of cardinality K. And then also in this case, of course, we have a very symmetric hypergraph. And so also in this case, we have uh, uh, an eigenvalue with very high multiplicity, in this case, n minus one. And then we have uh, by the theorem on the largest eigenvalue that k, the, the edge cardinality, the constant edge cardinality has multiplicity one. Um, and then, I mentioned the uh, Chigar inequalities for the case of a connected simple graph. Uh, 
um, we can actually reformulate these, these uh, inequalities in terms of G plus. So the signed graph obtained from G by letting each vertex being always an input. And then, as I said, the spectral properties of uh, lambda two, uh, sorry, of G and G plus are mirrored. And in this case, this is the, the way we reformulate the Chigar inequalities. So now they are uh, formulated in terms of the um, of lambda n minus one, the uh, second the largest eigenvalue of G plus. And for a K uniform hypergraph, we can define this generalized Chigar constant. Um, which has exactly the same geometric meaning as the as the Chigar constant in the graph case. And it also coincides with the Chigar constant in the graph case. And then using uh, this generalized Chigar constant, I was able to um, generalize the Chigar inequalities uh, and in particular to generalize uh, the uh, this last version of the Chigar inequalities. And so I proved that if a hypergraph is connected uh, k uniform and bipartite, then the largest eigenvalue is equal to k, uh, as I said. And then these uh, inequalities hold as a generalization of the classical Chigan inequalities. And as in the graph case, um, we can again use the eigenfunctions in order to approximate the Chigar cut. And in particular, if uh, the hypergraph has only inputs, uh, so the, the general case, we can again look at the eigenfunctions corresponding to lambda n minus one, and uh, we can let S uh, and S bar be the um, sets on which this eigenfunction has positive or non-positive values. Um, then we can also um, define the coloring number of a hypergraph as in the case of graph, uh, as the smallest number uh, needed in order to color all vertices of the hypergraph so that uh, if two vertices are contained in a given edge, then they don't get the same color. And there are, we also proved uh, some results uh, that relate the coloring number of the hypergraph with the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So for instance, this uh, inequality here um, as uh, uh, the analogous of some inequalities that hold for the graph case, but for the adjacency matrix. And <clears throat> similarly, one can also define the independence number, which is somehow similar to the coloring number. And in particular, we say that a, a set of vertices U is independent if uh, for each edge, U contains uh, at least one vertex uh, of that edge. And then the independence number of the hypergraph is the maximum cardinality of an independent set of vertices. And we proved uh, uh, also these two inequalities uh, that again relate uh, the, um, the independence number of a hypergraph with the eigenvalues uh, of the normalized Laplacian. And also these inequalities uh, are actually um, analogous to some properties that are some, some inequalities uh, that are known for the adjacency matrix of graphs. So we proved the, um, the same results, but for the normalized Laplacian and uh, for um, the more general case of hypergraphs. And um, the last thing I wanted to discuss uh, are spectral measures and spectral classes. Um, we define uh, a spectral measure, uh, the spectral measure of our hypergraph in this way, we consider for each eigenvalue lambda i, the Dirac measure centered at the eigenvalue. We take the sum of all these measures and we normalize it by the number of eigenvalues, so the number of vertices of the hypergraph. 
So the idea is that instead of looking at one specific eigenvalue, as we have done so far, we look at the entire spectrum in a way that uh, it is normalized so that it does not depend on the, um, on the size of the hypergraph. And if we have a growing family of hypergraphs, so Gn, uh, for n, uh, which is a natural number, then the sequence uh, of growing uh, family, the, the sequence of hypergraphs is said to belong to a spectral class rho if rho is a measure such that the spectral measure of Gn goes weakly to rho um, as n goes to infinity. So it describes uh, the behavior uh, at infinity of the spectral measure. And then uh, I proved that if we have uh, two growing sequences of hypergraphs that are not too different from each other in the sense that for each n, G1n and G2n are two hypergraphs on n nodes that differ by at most C1 edges of cardinality at most C2, where both C1 and C2 don't depend on N, then the difference uh, between the spectral measures uh, goes weakly to zero. Um, this is something that we expect because we are saying that if two growing families of hypergraphs don't differ too much, then also um, the difference of their spectral measures go to, to zero. Uh, it's something that we expect, but it's not uh, immediate to prove it. And also, um, I tried to prove it for stronger measures, uh, but I could also prove some particular cases. And for other cases, I actually found counterexamples. So uh, we can only prove it uh, with, uh, in this case, with a weak star convergence. And as I said, there are also generalizations of the oriented hypergraphs. Uh, for instance, uh, um, with the hypergraphs with for the hypergraphs with real coefficients, uh, we actually generalized uh, many of the properties uh, that I just presented. Uh, but they are somehow more elegant for the case of oriented hypergraphs. So I prefer to uh, to present them for the oriented uh, case. And um, also in the case of the complex unit hypergraphs, uh, many uh, of these properties can be generalized. And the difference is that in this case, instead of getting symmetric matrices, uh, we get Hermitian matrices. And uh, I also work on applications. Uh, in particular, I'm working uh, on, the, on some applications to dynamics uh, together with my uh, collaborators from the MPI and from Munich. And I'm working now uh, on applications to biology, biology and in particular data analysis uh, together with my collaborators from Aachen, uh, Southampton and London. So thank you very much and 